Chapter Seven of The Thing from the Lake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Thing from the Lake by Eleanor M. Ingram. Chapter Seven. For it is well known that Paris and such delicate beings live upon sweet odors as food. But all evil spirits abominate perfumes. Oriental Mythology The breakfast bell, or rather Phillida's Chinese chimes, merrily summoned me to the dining room, a homely spell to exercise the phantoms of the night. My little cousin, rosy beyond belief, trim in white midi blouse and blue skirt, was already in her place behind the coffee pot. Vere sat opposite her at the round table. They were holding hands across the rolls and bacon and eggs, their glances interlocked in a shining content that made my solitariness rather drab and dull to my own contemplation. At my clumsy step the picture dissolved, of course. Vere rose while Phillida welcomed me to my chair and went into a young housewife's pretty solicitude about my fruit and hot eggs. The sun glinted across the table. The very servant had a smiling air of enjoying the occasion. I never had a more pleasant breakfast. A big brindle cat purred on the window sill beside Phillida. No dainty Persian or Angora, but a battered veteran whose nicked ears and scarred tail proved him a battling cat of ring experience. I plan to have a wee white kitten, Phil explained, while putting a saucer of milk before the feline toff. One that would wear a ribbon, you know. You remember, Cousin Roger, how Mother always forbade pets because she believed animals carried germs? I meant to have a puss if ever I had a home of my own. This one just walked into the kitchen on the first day we came here. Ethan said it was a lucky sign when a cat came to a new home. He gave it the meat out of his sandwiches that we had brought for lunch, and it stayed. So I decided to keep it instead of a kitten. It really is more cat. What footing was here for dreary terrors? In a mirror across the room I glimpsed my own countenance looking quite as usual. No overnight white hairs appeared, no upstanding look such as the legend gave to Sir Sintram after he met the little master. After the meal, Vere asked me to walk over to the lake with him. We strolled through the old orchard toward the dam. This was my side of the house. In passing, I looked up at the window against which the thing had seemed to press itself with sickening lust for me. Phillida was framed in the open square, and shook a dustcloth at us by way of greeting and evidence of her busyness. The wide, shallow lake lay almost without movement, except at the head of the dam. There the water poured over with foam and tumult, an amber-brown cataract some twenty-odd feet across, to rush on below in a winding stream that grew calmer as it flowed. "'We must put our lake in order, Vere,' I observed, as we stood on a knoll at the head of the dam. "'All this growth of rank vegetation ought to be pulled up, the banks graded and turfed, perhaps, the bottom cleaned up. Water lilies would look better than cattails. To my surprise, he did not assent. Instead, he set his foot on a boulder and rested his arm upon his knee, looking into the clear water. Mr. Locke, I just about hate saying what I have to, he told me in his sober, leisurely fashion. I expect you won't like it, not at all. Well, Best said before you get deeper in. I can't see my way to make farming this place pay. I was bitterly disappointed. 
even at the worst estimate of Vere, I had imagined he would stick the thing out a little longer than this. Poor Phillida's time of happiness should have lasted more than these few weeks. But the call of New York, of the lounge lizard's case and unhealthy excitement had won already, it seemed. I said nothing at all. The blow was too sore. "'There are too few acres of arable land, and they're used up,' Vere was continuing. "'I've seen plenty of impoverished, run-out farms in New England. "'You could pour money into the soil out of a gold pitcher these five years to come, "'before it began to pay you back. "'And then your money might better have been put anywhere in bank, for profit. "'I saw that the first week here.' Since then, I've been looking around for something better to do. And have found it, of course, I said bitingly. Or else you would be drawing your salary as manager and saying nothing to me of all this. Well, where does poor Phil go, and when? He turned his dark curled head and regarded me with calm surprise. I didn't exactly know that my wife was going anywhere, Mr. Locke. What? You do not mean to leave the farm? Not unless you're tired of our bargain. I've been calculating how to make it pay. That won't be by planting corn and potatoes and taking a wagon load into town. If you think I'm wrong, call in any practical man who knows this sort of business. We've got to think closer to win here. That's why I'd like to set the lake to work instead of just prettying it up. The lake, Vere? There isn't enough water power over the dam to do any more than run a toy, is there? He motioned me nearer to where he stood gazing down. Notice what kind of water this is, Mr. Locke? brown like forest water, sort of green-lighted because the bottom is like turf, neither mud nor sand, but a kind of underwater moss. You see? It's pure and clean, with a little fishy smell about it. Matter of fact, it is forest water. Comes from way off yonder, the stream does, before it spreads out into our lake here. I borrowed a boat and followed back two miles before it got too shallow for me. Boys have caught trout here three times since I've been watching. Well? My father was fish warden in our district. I learned the business. If you're willing, I can start some trout raising that ought to pay well. You know, the state is glad to help game preserving, free. He proceeded to give me a brief lecture on the subject in his quiet, unpretentious manner, producing notes and diagrams from his pockets. He had written to various authorities and exhibited their replies. He knew exactly what the state would do, what he himself must do, and what investment of money would be required. I listened to him in admiration and astonishment. From fish-raising, he went on to discuss each acre of the farm, its best use in view of its situation, condition, and our needs. We could afford so much labor, it appeared, and no more. We must have certain apparatus, methodically listed with prices. If we used a certain sheltered south field for a peach orchard, the trees planted should be such an age and have giant powder-blast deep beds for them in order that they might soon bear fruit. When at last he ended his deceptive speech that sounded so lazy while implying so much energy, and turned his black eyes from the papers on his knee to my face, I had been routed long since. Veer, I said abruptly, did you know that I thought you were going to desert the farm when you began to speak? He nodded. Yes, I guess so. 
You don't exactly like me, haven't had any occasion to. You don't judge me a fit match for your cousin. Well, neither would anyone else, yet. He began to gather his papers together, his attention divided with them while he finished his answer. There will be plenty of time before that yet runs out. Mighty pleasant time, thanks to you, Mr. Locke. Phillida and I expect to enjoy building things up as much as we'll enjoy it after they're all built. Meantime, I prize what you're doing all the more because I know how you feel. Now, if you'd be interested to look over these plans or submit them to someone you've confidence in for inspection, I'll just turn them over to you. He had so accurately measured me that I was disconcerted. It was quite true that he was compelling my respect, while my first dislike of him still obstinately lurked in the background of my mind. I felt ungenerous, but I would not lie to him. "'I am a queer fellow, Vere,' I said. "'Leave that to time, as you say.' As for the plans, they are far beyond my scope. A city man, it has been my way to phone for an expert when anything was to be done, or to buy what I fancied and pay the bills. In this case, you are the expert. The plans seem brilliant to me. Certainly they are moderate in cost. Keep them, and carry them out as soon as that may be done. You are master here, not I. We walked back together through the sun and freshness of the early spring morning. As we neared the house, Phillida's voice hailed us. She was at my window again, leaning out with her hair wind-ruffled about her face. "'Cousin Roger,' she summoned me, "'I have found out what makes your room as sweet as a garden of spices.' See what it is to be a composer completely surrounded by royalties, able to buy the most gorgeous scents to lay on one's pillow, and all enclosed in antique gold. She held up some small object that shone in the sunlight. Throw it down, I begged, startled into excitement. She complied, laughing. Vere sprang forward, but I made a quicker step and caught the thing. It was one of those filigree balls of gold wrought into open work, about the size of a walnut that fine ladies used to wear swung from a chain or ribbon and call a pomander. The toy held a chosen perfume or essence supposed to be reviving in case my lady felt a swoon or me grim about to overwhelm her as ladies did in past centuries, and do no longer. Whose gentle pity had brought this pomander to my pillow, to help me from that faintness which had followed my struggle with the thing? Whose was the exquisite individual fragrance contained in the ball I held? I had a vision of a figure, surely light and soft of movement, haloed with such matchless hair as the braid I had captured, stealing step by timid step across my room, within my reach while I lay inert. Perhaps her face had bent near mine in her doubt of my life or death. Hidden eyes had studied me in the scanty starlight. Oh, for Ethan Vere's good looks and athlete's grace to lure my lady from her masquerade! "'Where did you buy it, Cousin Roger? Fess up!' Phillida's merry voice coaxed me. "'It was given to me,' I slowly answered. "'I cannot offer it to you, Phil, but I will buy any other pretty thing you fancy, instead, next time I go to town.' She made a gesture of disclaim. "'I did not mean that. Only do tell me what the perfume is.' I was going to ask if you knew. No, something very expensive and imported, I suppose. Perhaps whoever gave it to you had it made for herself alone, as some wealthy women do. 
It is the most clinging yet delicately refreshing scent I ever met. Tuberose, suggested Vere. Drawls, no, how can you? Like an old-fashioned funeral, she cried. Tuberose didn't always go to funerals, he corrected her teasingly as she made a face at him. I remember them growing in my Aunt Bathsheba's garden. Creamy-looking posies, kind of kin to a gardenia, seems to me. thick petaled like white plush, and holding their sweet smell everlastingly. But Mr. Locke's perfumery isn't just that, either. There was something else grew in that garden. I can't call to mind what I mean. Basil, maybe? The basil plant that feeds on dead men's brains, quoted Phil with a mock shiver. You are happy in your ideals, Drawls. He laughed. Well, that garden smelled pretty fine when the dew was just warming up in the sun mornings, and so does this little gilt ball. I'll guess Mr. Locke's lady never got it from France. Smells like old New England. There was no reason why a vague chill should creep over me, or the sunshine seemed to darken as if a thin veil drifted between me and the surrounding brightness. Let me say again that no place could have been more unlike the traditional haunted house. There hung about it no sense of morbidity or depression. Yet what was I to think? I was not sick or mad and the thing had come to me twice. I turned from the married lovers and made my way to the veranda, where I might be alone to consider the pomander whose perfume was like a diaphanous presence walking beside me. Seated there in one of the deep willow chairs Phillida had cushioned in peacock chintz and marked especially mine by laying my favorite magazines on its arm, I studied my new trophy of the night. There was a satisfaction in its material solidity. It was real enough, resting in my palm. Yes, but it was not ordinary among its quaint kind. As I picked out the design of the gold work, that fact was borne in upon my mind. Here was no pattern of scroll or blossom or cupids and hearts. The small sphere was belted with the signs of the zodiac, beautiful in minute perfection. All the rest of the globe was covered with lace-fine work, repeating one group of characters over and over. I was not learned enough to tell what the characters were, but the whole plainly belonged to those strange, outcast academies of astrology, alchemy, magic, in short. It contained what appeared to be a pinkish ball, originally a scented paste rolled round and dried, I judged by peering through the interstices of the gold. Had the old world trinket been left to bewilder me? Why, and by whom? What interest had my lady of the dark in elaborately deceiving me? Why muffle her identity in mystery? Why the indefinable quaintness of language, the choice of words that made her speech so different from even the college-bred Phillida's? She urged me to leave the house. If she, or anyone associated with her, wanted the place left vacant for some reason, why did not the thing and the warning come to others of our household group? Vere, Phillida, the Swedish woman, Christina, all had lived here for weeks without any experiences like mine. I had not been told to leave my room, but the house. The danger, then, was only for me? Well, was I to run away, hands over my eyes, at the first alarm? The gray cat came purring about me and presently leaped upon my knee. 
On impulse, I offered the pomander to its nostrils. The unwinking yellow eyes shut. The beast's powerful claws closed and unclosed with convulsive pleasure. It breathed with that thirsty eagerness for the scent so familiar to my own senses. "'Better than catnip, Bagheera?' I questioned. "'You wouldn't bolt from it either, would you?' Phillida's battered pet relaxed luxuriously, by way of answer, sniffed toward the hand I withdrew, and composed itself to sleep. I put the pomander in my waistcoat pocket. I could not deny as mere nightmare the thing which had visited me. Better confront that fact. It was real. Only real in what sense? What human agency could produce an effect so frightful, an illusion so hideous, that I could scarcely bear to recall it here in full daylight, without the use of a sight or sound to confuse the brain? Had the girl told the truth in her wild explanation, a truth hinted at by alchemists, Pythagoreans, Rosicrucians, pale students of sorcery and magnificent charlatans, these many centuries? Were there other races between earth and heaven, strange tribes of the middle spaces whose destinies were fixed and complete as our own, but between whose lives and ours were fixed barriers not to be crossed? Had I met one of these beings, inimical to man as a cobra, intelligent as man, hunting its victim by methods unknown to us? Was I a cheated fool or a prisoner on the borders of a new country? Could I meet that thing tonight and tomorrow night? Could I bear the agony of its presence? the stench of death and corruption that was its atmosphere? At the mere memory, my forehead grew wet. The postman's buggy had stopped at our mailbox. Phillida ran down to meet the event of the morning. Her laughing chatter came back to me while she waited, fists thrust in midi pockets, for the man to sort our letters from his bags. It did not appear so hard to make a woman happy, I mused. A man might attempt it with hope, if he could but persuade her to try him. My lady had promised to come again. Perhaps with patience. Phillida came across the lawn with an armful of gaudy-covered catalogues and a handful of letters. Catalogues for Ethan, letters for you she called in advance of her arrival. What an important person you are, Cousin Roger. It always gives me a quivery thrill to realize who you are as well as how nice you are. Now, isn't that a jumbled speech to tumble out of me? I took her tanned little hand along with the letters, letters that were so many voices summoning me back to pleasant, busy Manhattan. It is a fine speech for a humble person to answer, Phil. But does that sort of thing matter to you women? What do you love Vere for, at bottom? Because he is strong and supple and has curly hair? No? As she shook her head. Because he has worn the uniform, then? Proved his courage in war at sea? Because he had the glamour about him of real adventure and cabaret glitter? or because he took you away from a life you hated? Or perhaps because he is kind and loves you? No. For none of these reasons? Why, then, love Ethan Vere? She stopped vigorously, shaking her head in repeated denial, and smiled at me triumphantly. Because he is Ethan Vere, she promptly responded. Oh, Cousin Roger, you clever people are so stupid. It would not make any difference at all if drawls were ugly, or never had been a sailor, or could not skate or do things, or had not been able to make me happy. It is something very much bigger than all that. 
And all the divorce courts, Phil? The breach of promise suits and the couples who make each other miserable? But they never had anything, she said. Perhaps they will have it some day. Don't you know, Cousin Roger, that the most important things in the world are those most people never know about? I was not sure whether I knew that or not. After last night, I was not sure of many things. Still, if such gifts were given as she believed, if it was merely a question of being Ethan Vere or Roger Locke, but I had never seriously considered leaving the adventure. End of chapter 7 Recording by Roger Moline